Hello and welcome to another episode of Building Success, a real estate podcast. My name is Nick and I will once again be your guide as we talk to some of the best and brightest in the worlds of real estate tech, operations, and financials from across the globe. This podcast would not be possible without listeners like you, so if you like what you hear and you want to hear more of it, please consider liking and subscribing to the podcast on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Beyond Pod, uh, YouTube, anywhere where you listen to this podcast. We'd certainly appreciate it. Helps us in the rankings and lets us know how we're doing. So today we're going to continue on our series of episodes that were recorded at the International Users Conference from MRI uh, in October in Atlanta, Georgia. And today we're going to be listening in on tech challenges in investment organizations. And though it was titled as such, uh, this really does have applicability across uh, real estate organizations. Uh, We had a great panel Abhinav Samani from Leverton, Josh Malinoff from Redirect Consulting, and Ray Lebrun from Cohn Resnick, uh, formerly NOI Strategies. Uh, The three of them spoke to some of the challenges that are facing real estate organizations today, some of the real big opportunities in the technology space, and listening in from people that are providing software solutions as well as consulting services. uh, It was a really great panel moderated by my friend and colleague Andy Birch, I hope you really enjoy it. Uh, I got a lot out of it listening in on it. I hope you do as well. So without further ado, let's take you to the episode. Well, good morning. Congratulations. You survived to the last day, so that's all good. Um, I'm actually quite pleased with the turnout for this. and I was just talking with the guys about how we're going to do this next year. Um, So any feedback on that? More kind of suggestions on the kind of panels that you'd like to see would be hugely appreciated. Um, So let's get back to today and what we're covering. Um, So we're going to cover some of the technology challenges in investment organizations. And in reality, this is kind of for any real estate organization, whether it's from an investment angle or from the property management side, you know, to front office. Um, These are some of the challenges that organizations face. Um, We're kind of privileged, I I guess, because we go to a number of events on a regular basis and we get to kind of experience some of these technologies, talk about it. uh, And we just thought it was a good idea if we kind of share some of that general kind of feedback about what's going on uh, with the audience this morning. Um, So let me just get through the the housekeeping. Um, thank you to our sponsors, especially these three that volunteered to, uh, to join the panel this morning and make this a lot more interesting than just me talking about it. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to let these guys introduce themselves. So first, let's start with Abe, who's the CEO at Leverton. Over to you. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, I'm the CEO of Leverton, an artificial intelligence uh, data extraction company for contracts, legal and corporate contracts, particularly in the real estate industry, uh, real estate leases, and other types of documents. Um, I'm based out of New York and uh, really happy to be here um, being a partner with uh, MRI. Um, This is our third year, I think, at the MRI conference, and it's just amazing to see how much it continues to grow and all the diverse people that are coming from all different backgrounds now to learn about how to kind of propel technology in the real estate industry. Yeah, and Abe's done some really cool stuff uh, in conjunction with MRI. Uh, He's also helped in terms of uh, podcasts, providing a a much deeper insight into things like AI. Um, So if what you hear this morning is interesting, listen to the podcast as well to get that, that, that deeper level understanding of what's going on. Josh. All right, well, good morning. Uh, My name is Josh Malinoff. I'm a principal at Redirect Consulting. So Redirect uh, helps real estate companies, really focuses on the areas of investment management, asset management, property management, accounting. So what we do is we come in and help your business become more efficient using uh, technology. Um, We have uh, folks all over the country and uh, have been working with MRI for 
oh, quite a long time. So this is actually our 20th uh, year sponsoring um, and presenting at the user conferences and uh, have a long history of uh, great partnership. Yeah, I would echo that. So Josh's team have been working on some of our biggest kind of investment uh, implementations uh, and have been uh, a valued partner for some time now. Ray. Uh, my name is Ray LeBron. I'm with Cohn Resnick, specifically the Commercial Real Estate Advisory Group. Uh, we were, <coughs> were still known as NOI Strategies, but there were slowly becoming all Cone Resnick. Uh, and we have been a partner with MRI, I think officially a partner in the last couple of years, but uh, as NOI Strategies, we worked with them for the past few years. Uh, we do very much the same thing that uh, our our redirect does. We, you know, we help clients strategize and, and use people process and their technology better. And so that's yeah. Again, great, great insight into what's going on in the industry. Uh, team is fantastic, uh, given a, a good perspective on what's going on out there. Okay, so what are we covering this morning? Um, we can't just cover technology kind of A to Z or A to Z as I would say, but anyway. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna hit some of the key kind of hype things that are going on out there. Uh, and, and, and really, that kind of just leads on to the next slide. This is a bit of an eye chart, and I don't expect you to read it, but it, it's just, I get, as I was kind of thinking about this session, I started kind of reflecting on how different technologies have been hyped up over the last 10 years. Um, and then thinking about how really they've been adopted within the industry, or not as the case may be. Some of those uh, technologies on that Gartner hype cycle, if you've seen that kind of curve, so it goes through that, uh, that kind of peak of excitement down through the trough of disillusionment and then hopefully out onto the plateau of productivity if it makes it through the bottom of that curve. Um, so some of the ones that we're going to touch on today mm. are things like big data, uh, AI, blockchain, and then we're just going to have a general discussion uh, about other technologies that we're starting to see, um, and, and maybe hopefully some, uh, some predictions about, uh, about what's going to happen next. Um, so the first one we're going to start with is, is big data. So before we actually start on big data though, uh, we've been on a number of panels together and we've talked about technology in the investment space. One of the things that I think we're starting to realize as a group is that when you look out there, particularly in that kind of North America investment marketplace, things that were kind of discretionary before, things that were just, well, I use Excel today for that. I don't really need a system for it. Um, I've got a team of people that would just type in the lease details. I don't really need a system for that. What people are finding is now that in order to kind of compete more effectively, it's a saturated market out there. In, in order to provide the kind of customer service to their investors that they are actually looking to provide, that it's no longer a discretionary spend. These are things that, whereas you used to think of just about the kind of GL or the uh, AP ledger as the things that were definitely must-haves, it's a much broader spectrum of technology solutions that you need in order to compete uh, more effectively in the marketplace. So the first one we're gonna to touch on is big data. Um, so this is bit, this term, this is kind of our oldest one, really, uh, out of the ones that we're discussing today. Um, this has been um, around for some time now, uh, and we're really looking at how, how, is this, uh, how is this being adopted? What's going on? Um, are, a, are organizations just taking too long to get on this kind of obvious technology? So I'm gonna start with Ray. Right, what's your kind of view on this? So, you know, the big, the term big data has been around for a long time, and it, and it, it to me, it's this kind of, it's nebulous what it, what it kind of means, but what, and it has taken a while to adopt. I think, though, in smaller terms, companies are starting to realize the data that they have, 
and starting to slice things different ways. I want to see things by region. I want to see things by asset manager. I want to see things by uh, asset type. And, and now it's starting to understand how much data that they actually own and have and trying to capture that data and then use it, utilize it in meaningful ways. And I think now we're starting to see that more. People are starting to see the value of, of their data and how to normalize it and do analytics upon it. Uh, you know, it's no longer enough just to see how well our assets performing, or how well are my investments performing, but start using that data to understand why is this one doing better than this one. And starting, now we're starting to see some, the introduction of third party data, not just internal data, uh, to understand why and then maybe later down the road, you know, predictive which, where's the best place to spend my investment dollars because these assets are going to be similar to the ones that are doing well. And I think it's starting to happen more. Uh, and it's one of the things that's a challenge for companies that have been operating a long time trying to get all the data that they know they already have and where they want to go. Okay, okay. Abe, what's your view on what's going on with big data? Yeah, so um, uh, like Ray said, big data is, is kind of this nebulous term. I mean, if I take a thousand light items in Excel, I think I can call it big data and run like a quick pivot table. I would say I'm doing data analytics, right? Um, it's 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 funny in, in in the in the commercial real estate market and in the investment market if you look at real estate overall over any 10 year period of time it's pretty much outperformed every major indice since um, you know the 20s or the 30s and so when you have an asset class that uh, provides uh, you know high returns in sort of the 10 to 20 percent return area you have all these great depreciation benefits that we've just now in Congress uh, extended essentially indefinitely, um, you have like very little reason for investment managers uh, to, to, to invest in technology to, if it doesn't move the needle enough. So if you go and you tell you know, your team, the investment team, and you say, hey, let's invest in this analytics platform, it can give you all these great insights. And they're like, well, we're meeting our numbers this year and we're delivering performance, so why should we do it? And then what happens is the economy cycles and you go to a recession and you underperform, and then they all come back to you and you're like, why didn't you implement the technology that could have gave us the warnings and the signals that this was happening, right? I mean, something simple in 2007, 2008 from your accounting system would have been that, hey, you're, a whole bunch of tenants just started lagging in their payments. And that would give you a clear you know, forewarning and indicator that like you're not collecting cash, something's wrong, and then you go check the health of the tenants, you know, ask them to do an audit of their financial statements, which you're probably allowed to by the leasing, and all of a sudden you would have un uncovered that half your tenants are like going down or under or whatever, right? Um, but that doesn't happen, so you have to find that like clear strategy uh, in sort of between economic cycles, and I think who knows where we are in, in this cycle. It seems like the good times are going to keep rolling for, for a long time, but we all know that the, the economy will cycle, whether it's sharp or whether it's slower. Um, you need to kind of be prepared for that, and that's where we have to kind of find really, really good use cases for the analytics. And you don't want to go out with this entire very comprehensive, let's do big data across every single spectrum. Find like one problem, one use case that you feel like you can answer with some big data analytics, prove to the investment management team that this data is going to be relevant and it's going to be important, and do stress tests with it. So show them, hey, while things are good, this data is going to make you be even better at what you're doing. And when things get really, really bad, which they might, this data could help you prevent you know, that next loss of you know, your investment dollars. So everybody likes big data. Everybody wants to do big data. But big data doesn't have to be big. It can actually be small. And you can actually make a lot of wins by, by doing it that way. OK, I, 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 and I, I think that's a great point. You know, I was just thinking myself about the fact of you know, where are we in the cycle? How does big data help us in terms of that kind of pre predictive uh, <coughs> perspective? I'm going to get to Josh in just one second, but just through a show of hands, who thinks this cycle is almost ending? OK, a couple of people not so positive about it. Who thinks it's like at least another three or four years away? Who thinks this is just one long, exciting ride and it's never going to end? <laughs> okay. Canadian, I can't answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Josh. Yeah, so a um, lot to talk about here. So uh, big data, I guess, you know, first of all, we got to kind of think about it as a term and, and what it means to the real estate space, right? Big data to a manufacturing company who has tremendous volume is, is very different than what we talk about 
uh, within the real estate context of you know very low volume, minimal transactions, buying, selling buildings, recurring rents to tenants, payments to vendors, um, even for the largest owner operators or investment management firms, that that's a small amount of data. So, so big data is going to be a theme that you're going to hear a little bit more about this morning around what can you do with that data, not you personally, but what can the machines do with it for machine learning and artificial intelligence. So this is the sort of the genesis of you need big data to make all those cool buzzwords that you're hearing have value. So um, there's a big question still out there, does real estate have big data? So there's certain areas like pricing, um, yeah, energy, uh, clearly where there's a, a, a lot of opportunity there. But we're even seeing basic things, you know, like Abe mentioned, where, hey, we, we don't have big data per se, but we have data historically that we can use for predictive analytics, those 2007, 2008 warning signs that you talked about, you know, two years too late. Um, so the, the challenges here are enormous. Um, we can talk a little bit about some of the things we can do um, everyone can do to, to overcome those challenges, but as many of you probably are aware, you're struggling a little bit now with where the data is. So to, to get to this um, answer around analytics and, and to help your investors who are asking for all kinds of information, um, we see many of our clients struggle with that because a lot of that data is not in a place that it can be um, analyzed. It's in Excel spreadsheets. It's it's not yet um, in a place. So one of the first baby steps you have to, to think about, um, if you haven't already, is take an inventory of you know, where all that data is and how much of it are in you know, normalized databases versus how much are in people's um, you know, file drawers or, uh, or, or uh, local network drives as Excel files. Um, so that, that's your very first step, and we're going to talk a little bit more about once you have it um, in a database what you can do with yeah. it. Yeah. Um, any of you want to come back on any of those points? Only I would say is I, I don't, I, big data, the analytics portion is just starting. I think. Yeah. We're just starting to understand how to use the data and it's, uh, and as Josh said, getting the data is really the key and how do you get it into consumable ways and there aren't a lot of efficient ways yet that we yeah, I, did the, I think that I think you're right. I think the technology is only just now catching up on how to analyze that big data that you've got, uh, and that technology is helping to actually uncover issues in that data. And now we're going to get full cycle in in terms of now looking at the AI uh, aspects and so on in terms of improving the consistency <coughs> of that data, which we're come on to in a, in, a, in a minute. Has anyone got any questions uh, about big data? No? Who's already think that they've got a, a, a big data implementation project going on that they're happy with, that they're making progress with? Tammy? Yeah. OK. OK. I think one of the other problems, and, and, and you can see it from the show of hands, is when you're faced with the question of, of big data, the possibilities are literally endless. You don't mm. really know where to start. If we look at other technology transformations that you may have done in your business over the past 10 or 15 years, there's generally been a roadmap. There's generally only been three or four possible ways to do something. There's only like, you know, two ways to do cost allocated depreciation. There's like, there's limited choices and you just had to pick. Like, you know, I either go with this vendor or I go with this process. When you go to big data, you literally can compare anything on an X and Y axis and come up with a million different interpretations as well. I can take my rent roll and compare it to stock market performance. I can take the average days that it takes me to collect cash and compare it to, you know, the, the price of cotton candy. Like, you know, like it's just sort of endless, right? Yeah. And so I think that's what makes it all the more confusing is the fact that you have all these endless possibilities and you kind of need to figure out, okay, what's, what's actually meaningful, what's important, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, and I think, on top of that, I think the industry remains kind of underserved in this area because um, I, I, I think some of you would probably deal with maybe NACREF or IPD or someone like that. Um, that's probably about the only kind of decent kind of benchmark data in there. Uh, you, you're probably extending processes within your own organizations, so you are kind of collecting your own data. 
but to truly take advantage of market data, data outside of your organization, organization to bring in, to, to do kind of um, comparable analysis, benchmarking, et cetera, it's not that easy. Not that easy. Yeah. Just one comment. I mean, we got the first step. Get that database together and collect the information you have. And then the question is, okay, what do you do with it before you start thinking about what external data can we bring in to start to process? So our initial approach was the IT group said, well, let's just put some dashboards together and throw it out, which worked with some people and didn't work with other people because they didn't know exactly what the end users were looking for. So I think to address kind of that first issue with, okay, we've got our data, what do we do with it, is find a problem or one thing that you think you can solve and then work with that individual or that user group and say, let's tailor a solution for you. Mm -hmm. And that's a win for the data. And, and now move on to kind of the next step. And that's, that's the process we're going through is pick a group that has an issue, give them a solution, and then go from there with that one kind of feather under your cap. I'll let Josh and Ray come back on this in a second, but uh, a question for you. Um, do you feel like you've got an adequate kind of cross-functional team that are actually assessing that? Or is it just IT saying, well, they probably kind of need this metric or? Uh, I, I think we do now. When, the, okay. pro, when the, the project originally kicked off, it was really IT and operations, and right. the communication was, okay, what do you need? Great, we'll put something together, but they don't under, they didn't understand the business side, what was yeah. truly needed, and, and what metrics or how the users would actually look at the information and want to see it. So now we've got a team that is across departments that yeah. uh, up front is saying, Here's what we need. Here's how we want to digest it. Here's why it's meaningful. So then the IT group really has an understanding of what what's going to be you what what will actually be appreciated and utilized. Because if you don't get the utilization in the end, yeah, the project fails and it never moves forward. Exactly. Yeah. Ray, do you want to? Yeah, I think your approach is right, and Abe touched on it as well. You know, data having all this data is great, but if you don't have an ant question to answer you could use misuse it and it becomes you know not useful uh, and so you have to have specific questions that you want to answer and then you <coughs> use that data to answer those questions and, and that's when you start to add on to it and you start understanding which outside factors may or may not impact those questions and I think that's the way you approach it. you start with one question and you go and you build on to it and that's what makes meaningful out output meaningful analytics are useful and that, now your data becomes useful and, and it builds on from that yeah, d different companies are answering that question differently. So, so um, one, one trend we're seeing is a common theme of those who have overcome the challenge of aggregating the data and normalizing, getting into a warehouse or, or something like that. Um, the common theme is, is, is they don't know how to present it to the business. So, so um, a couple ways to approach it. One, you know, Abe and Ray touched on around find a very specific problem, address it that it builds adoption and, and, and gets people interested in, in the hard work required to aggregate it and, and, and you know, make meaningful decisions. Um, but we also see the um, data strategy and, 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 and some larger firms, the chief data officer role. Um, and what that is is somebody who says, our most valuable asset besides the buildings we own is, is our data, right? That, that's what differentiates us as a business in the market and can make, give us a tremendous competitive advantage but we don't know what to do with it. So um, some firms are investing in, 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 well, either a cross-functional team like you described, or a dedicated role that acts as almost like an Uber um, business analyst, somebody who interfaces between IT, who helped to capture the, and aggregate the data, and the business to figure out what, where, where those questions are and what information is needed. And, and that role is, is like becoming super important. So. Um, doesn't have to be a full-time role, um, it, 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 but it is something um, everyone should probably start uh, thinking about if you haven't already. Yeah, I, I've actually heard that term a few times, the yeah. CDO, yeah. Chief Data Officer. Well, uh, don't make the first uh, prediction. Yeah, the, uh, go ahead. <laughs> so I'm gonna go out there. I believe in 2019, dashboard will be the most hated word in the technology industry. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe that you will have a dashboard for your dashboards. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Um, this could be the other most hated word in the industry. 
which is blockchain. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit about blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Um, you know, we're hearing it a lot. I, I, I know that many of you, you're kind of faced with day-to-day -day challenges and you're kind of thinking about this stuff and preparing your organizations or trying to prepare your organizations for, for what's coming next. Um, so I'm going to get the insight of these three esteemed gentlemen to give us their views on, on blockchain and how it's being used. Um, I'm going to start with Josh, though, because uh, Josh and I have uh, covered this a couple of times, uh, and Josh can give a, a kind of succinct um, definition, let's say, of, of, of what this is to start with. Thanks, Andy. I'll try. Um, so, you know, blockchain is uh, and crypto. You're hearing uh, about constantly, right? It's it's you can't uh, turn on your computer, or see a news feed, um, and and you know the big challenge that you know that we're seeing is is how does this really apply to me? How, how can I use it within the context of a real estate firm? Um, and, and there there are uh, a couple things to consider. One, um, the good news is there's some immediate application. The not so good news is you're going to have to have a little bit of patience and kind of few, predict where we're going to be in 10 years. Um, some of these uh, technologies, quite frankly, um, have been built in advance of the market being able to adopt it. Um, so one great example of that is the tokenization of real estate. Um, is anyone familiar with that concept? Okay, good. Um, we, we're seeing um, a strong push to make real estate easier to buy and sell. Um, so uh, in today's market, uh, and historically, doing a real estate transaction, a buy-sell, is incredibly um, time-consuming, uh, very expensive uh, from an overhead perspective, given all the um, entities involved in that transaction, as well as um, very inapproachable for most individuals um, or even smaller companies. The uh, minimum uh, required to invest is high and the, the liquidity of it is very low. Um, so it makes it a um, risky short-term investment and um, longer term sometimes harder to get out when you need to. So, so there's a big push for um, tokenizing the real estate. So what that means is putting the building, whether it's you know this hotel or a, a property in Singapore um, on on, uh, on the blockchain and, and basically breaking it into lots of little pieces that you can buy and sell through the blockchain. So the blockchain is just a ledger. So <laughs> despite all, all the hype and, and excitement, it, at the end of the day, the blockchain is just a ledger of transaction. It's different from the standpoint of it's decentralized, meaning that ledger is replicated across many, many machines and, and is really hard to, as a result to, um, to break and, and can be trusted as a, um, a, a transaction that's been recorded. So if you can um, <coughs> offer the components of the real estate in these little um, tokens, they're, they're on the blockchain backed by cryptocurrency, um, you as individuals can now think about buying real estate differently and getting out of it much easier. So your vehicles today are you know, private equity, which is you know, very high net worth or uh, institutional. REITs, which you can invest in, but very little control, right? You know, if you invest in a public <coughs> REIT, you're buying a, a portfolio. So the 10-year future is you as individuals are gonna be able to go on vacation, buy a fraction of a building that you are interested in, very quickly um, gain that ownership share and be very easily 